one on one and will intermittently come back to the whiteboard so I can explain everything to you in real time. I'd like to welcome to the channel someone I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I have been following this guy for many years and he's really helped me to shape the way I think about investing. He is the leading expert on rental properties and investing, or he calls them income properties. He's the host of the mega popular podcast, Creating Wealth Show. Jason Hartman, thanks for being here, buddy. George, thanks for having me. I know we just met, uh, well, we haven't met in person ever, but we, uh, we met uh, when we uh, talked just two or three days ago, and uh, one of our clients discovered your YouTube channel and yeah. just loved it. And he said, you mentioned me. So I, of course, I had to check out your videos. And uh, you do a great job explaining some very complex concepts. Uh, so hats off to you. I'm sure your listeners really appreciate that. Um, and I, I love your whiteboard videos. You, <laughs> they're, they're great. I appreciate it. So I've been listening to you since 2012. Some Seven years. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some time. of the viewers that I have might not be too familiar with with your work. So if you want to make, maybe just give them a 30 second Reader's Digest version of why you are the best in the business. What makes Jason Hartman the best and the most experienced guy out there? Well, well, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I got interested in the real estate business when I was 16 years old. I grew up poor in Los Angeles, California. I did not like being poor very much. And I, I saw a infomercial for a real estate guru, went out and bought his book, read three chapters, put it down. My mom picked it up, read the rest, and, uh, you know, kind of just became interested. I got my real estate license my first year in college uh, when I was 19 years old or, or and uh, just before my, yeah, just before my 20th birthday. Bought my first rental property about six months later when I was 20 years old, and I've been going ever since, and uh, I, I just love this business. And uh, the last 15 years, I've been um, basically... I'd call myself like a, a financial advisor for real estate investors. For sure, for sure. Where, where we help people invest nationwide and, um, you know, just help them make sense of the investment landscape and, and the economic landscape too and how we can sort of play the game or really, I should say, almost game the system. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, most people, I'm sure your, your viewers, George, would agree that uh, the way the monetary and fiscal policy is set up, it's, it's, it's really just a giant scam. And yep. it's meant to hurt the little guy, it's meant to hurt the middle class, and enrich the elite class. And we can complain about that as much as we want, but we're probably never going to change it. So I just say, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> and mm. align, you know, we teach people how to align their interest with the two most powerful forces the human race has ever known, maybe maybe excluding God from that, <laughs> <you know? laughs> but uh, but those two forces are are governments and central banks, right? Very powerful entities, and we just want to align our interests with them so we can make as much money as possible uh, playing their game, if you will. Okay, guys, when Jason talks about aligning your interests with the government, he's not talking about going into a third world country and bombing it or asking everyone what their preferred pronouns are. What he is referring to specifically is the government is the largest debtor nation of all time. That means that they need inflation to reduce the value or the overall burden of their debt. So what Jason's suggesting is that you buy a cash flowing asset that will pay you to own it with that debt that the government has, knowing darn well that the government is gonna run to the Fed and say, Fed, please bail us out, we can't pay our bills. And the Fed says, okay, fine, we'll create inflation for you. So they inject more money into the economy and they try to increase the velocity of that money. So if we have this much money in our system right now, and the Fed gets more money circulating in the economy at a faster rate, that makes the cost of goods and services rise. Also, incomes. Now, this doesn't make you any more rich, even though your income might go from 50,000 a year to 100,000 a year, you can't buy any more stuff 
because the stuff increased in value at the same rate that your wages increased. The only thing that happened is now you have to pay the government more money because you're making more money. So more tax revenue goes to the government and that allows it to service its debt easier. But the same thing happens with your debt because it's a fixed rate loan. The more inflation that the government creates to bail themselves out with the Federal Reserve's help, the lower the burden becomes on your debt as well because you are paying it back with cheaper dollars. So when Jason talks about aligning your interests with the government, he's specifically talking about taking on some debt because he knows the government will devalue that debt. A lot of people ask me, they say, George, how can you do a video on a on the housing bubble and then suggest real estate? So right. people have to understand that not only is real estate local, but it's hyper local. So, it's and I know you talk a lot about that on your podcast. So maybe you can explain to us quickly how there are certain markets in the United States that are in this massive bubble like Los Angeles, San Francisco, mm -hmm. Seattle, but then there are other markets that I like, and I know you like a lot, where the prices are, are much more sane and something that could be interesting even in a time when these other markets are so high. Yeah, a good question. I think it's really helpful if all uh, people interested in investments, in financial success, personal finance, and especially real estate, understand that the entire world can be categorized into three basic types of real estate markets. Uh, one is mm -hmm. the linear market. That's the type we like. Uh, another one is the cyclical market. And another one is the hybrid market, okay? So if we were looking at a chart, and you inspired me, so I'm going to go to the whiteboard here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't use the whiteboard too much, folks, but here's the whiteboard, okay? I do have one. I, I hardly right. ever use it. Very so cool. with, with the whiteboard here, um, uh, you know, these, these three types of markets all have certain characteristics and they kind of play a certain way, if you will. So if you're looking at a graph, right, with a typical X and Y axis, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see this very well. I can. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at this graph, uh, the, the typical type of real estate market that most people uh, know about and think think of, right, is the cyclical market, right? That's, that's the one that everybody talks about and, and thinks about. And it looks like that. It looks like a roller coaster, okay? And, and, and that's the typical market. Now, that's the cyclical market. It's got really glorious highs and really ugly lows, and it's got these cycles, thus the name cyclical, right? And the linear market uh, also has highs and lows, but they're not nearly as pronounced. They, uh, they go up a little bit and they go down a little bit, but it's, it's a much uh, less significant uh, thing, okay? That's the linear market. And then the hybrid market, as the name would suggest, is, you know, in between the two, okay? It's, uh, it has more pronounced highs, more pronounced lows. I didn't draw that right, but I think you get the idea, okay? Sure. So we like the linear markets because we are cash flow investors. We're looking to invest for yield on our properties, not capital appreciation. Why not? Listen, I love capital appreciation if I can get it. I, I've just never met anybody in all my years in the business who can reliably predict the cycles in the market, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we all have a sense of when it's going up and coming down, but it's very hard to time it exactly. So uh, let me give you examples of some of these markets, okay? Sure. Cyclical markets would be places like, uh, as you mentioned, Los Angeles. That's my hometown. I grew up in LA, okay? Uh, pretty much uh, the, the coastline, okay? So the California coastline um, in, into Portland a little bit, uh, certainly Seattle cyclical markets, okay? Uh, again, Markets that get all the headlines, make all the news. South Florida, another cyclical market. The expensive northeastern markets, New York, Washington, D.C., those expensive areas of Connecticut and, and Boston, Massachusetts, cyclical markets, right? Mm -hmm. And 
The vast majority of the world, though, is a linear market. Now, let's go foreign. Let's go offshore since you have a global audience, okay? Cyclical markets around the world, Paris, London, Dubai, Hong Kong, cyclical markets, okay? Uh, really amazing highs. Everybody's talking about it. They're very newsworthy uh, and really ugly lows. When times are bad, people really get hurt in those markets, okay? And again, the vast majority of the world is a linear market. Hybrid markets, on the other hand, in between the two uh, would be places like Denver, Colorado, Austin, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona. Those are hybrid. They're kind of in between, right? They're not crazy, but, uh, but they're, they're a, little bit, a little bit crazy. And so these linear markets are really good cash flow markets where uh, you can follow my 10 commandments of successful investing. And, and commandment number five is thou shalt not gamble. And what we mean there, George, is the property must make sense the day you buy it or you, you simply don't buy it. Uh, and how do you know if a property makes sense? Well, cash flow will tell you if it makes sense. That's right. How do you know, how do you know what cash flow is? The rent to value ratio or the RV ratio. And what we like to do is try and get around 1% per month of the property value. So if the property is, if it costs you $100,000, if you can get $1,000 a month, somewhere in that ballpark, mm -hmm. you're doing great. That's a good yeah. deal, okay? Yeah. Um, versus Los Angeles, a cyclical market that doesn't make any sense, okay? There, your typical RV or rent-to-value ratio is going to be 0.4 or 0.35. So the example there is, a Huge $1 difference. million, dollar, yeah, well, let's, let's take a $1 million property, just multiply it by 10, okay? A $1 million property in that market, you might get maybe $4,000 a month rent, okay? Not a very good deal at all. So in, in the cyclical market, you are automatically a gambler. You are automatically a speculator. Something great has to happen for you to make money, and that something great is appreciation. But what if it doesn't happen? You're, you're going broke because you bought a property where you are losing money every month in order to speculate on a potential future, which may never occur. Right. And I, I want to interject something here. And I've heard you say this a lot. And I know that the, whomever's going to push back on this, they're going to say, Jason, yeah, that's right. But boy, you can make so much more money if you invest when the market is low in a place like San Francisco or Seattle. And I recall you actually doing the math. I don't know if it was on your website or you did it on the podcast, but you showed where you actually end up making more money through the income property than you do in these crazy cyclical markets. Can you explain that quickly? You know, thank you for bringing that up because I can't find that episode where I did that example. <laughs> well, I, I, I can attest to it. You did it because I listened I, to it three or four you, times. You know, I did that about four years ago, and I was looking through my calendar because I distinctly remember I was meeting with two of our clients at Starbucks in La Jolla, California, and one of them, they, they both live there, and, and I lived there for a short time as well, and one of them was saying that, you know, he's doing my strategy, buying these you know, nationwide, these out of state properties and, and, you know, these little cheap houses for $140,000, but he's also doing San Diego, California, right? Cyclical mm -hmm. market for sure. And, um, and, and he said, you know, I just think the next few years are going to be great in San Diego. And by the way, he turned out to be right. Okay. He was right. You know, he did predict that there would be a lot of appreciation and he, he nailed it. Okay. He, he got it. But I, I went back and I recorded a podcast right after that, that meeting that morning at Starbucks. And I did the math. I just back of the napkin kind of math. I said, look, if you buy this property for maybe $300,000 and, you know, he was buying condos in downtown San Diego and, uh, and if it appreciates at, 10 or even 15% annually, which is fantastic appreciation. Mm -hmm. You know, very rare that you get that kind of thing. But, you know, a few years of every 10, you do, right, usually. And, um, and, and then you look at the cash flow on that property and how much you're losing every month to obtain that appreciation. Right. It was still not a winner, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Compared yeah. to the linear market. Compared to the linear market, yeah, where you got positive cash flow.
I just happen to have the back of a napkin right here, and it's already got some math on it. A chart of Los Angeles home prices, Case Shiller adjusted for inflation, 1988 is our starting point. 2018 is where we end. It goes up, down, then way up the top of the bubble in 2006, it comes back down a little bit, then comes right back up almost to the 2006 levels. If you would have invested $600,000, that's what we're gonna use for our benchmark, back here in 89, you would have almost doubled your money over this 30 year time frame. So let's pause that for a moment and go first to the RV ratios. That's the amount of money per month that you're getting in rent relative to the price of the asset. In Los Angeles, it's gonna be about 0.5. So if we spent $600,000, our monthly gross rents will be about 3,000. In Little Rock though, we can get 1% or more RV ratio. So for that $600,000 invested, we're gonna get $6,000 a month in rent. But the naysayers will say, yeah, but that market's crazy. There's no appreciation. That's just boring and dull and no real pro real estate investor invests in Little Rock because you don't have any capital gains. So in Los Angeles, we would have had $600,000 of capital gains. We would have doubled our money. In Little Rock, Arkansas, we would have had $0,000 in capital gains or okay, whichever you prefer. And that's just assuming that we had no appreciation in Little Rock whatsoever adjusted for inflation. But cash flow is where it starts to get interesting. The cash flow per month in Los Angeles would be negative $500. You'd have a negative cash flow every month. In Little Rock, you would have $1,600 in positive cash flow every month. And that's taking these numbers and lessing out the expenses. So in Los Angeles, over this 30 year time frame, you'd have a negative $180,000 in cash flow, Little Rock, Arkansas, a positive $576,000 in cash flow. So if you total everything up in Los Angeles, the high flying market where the real pros invest, you would have made $480,000. Little Rock, Arkansas, you would have made $576,000. So Jason, what the back of the napkin tells us is that you are spot on over the long haul you'll make more money in those boring linear markets. See, in the linear market, um, and I don't remember the example, unfortunately, but I do remember it was, it seemed to be valid when I, when I gave the example. I almost think, you're, I want to say Indianapolis. Yeah, it, it might have been an Indianapolis property, where in that, in that case, you're probably $300 per month positive cash flow and a little cheap $100,000 property at that time. It's not quite as good now, just so you know, but it's still pretty good. Uh, and, um, you know, on that San Diego property, you might have been, I don't know, $800 or $1,000 a month negative, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, if you look at like you're in the whole $12,000 a year in the San Diego property, how much appreciation do you have to have to offset that versus being $300 or what would that be? $3,600 a year positive in Indianapolis, right? It, it was still not that good a deal. In the, and in you the got so market. much more downside if you yeah. have to have that appreciation, if it never right. comes. And what I always show people is that a chart I like to use going back to 1890 of the U.S. housing market adjusted for inflation. And you see that there's a very specific trend line. And we were, the delta between the trend line and where we were in 2006 was enormous. And yeah. a lot of these markets, it's even higher now. So is it really worth that gamble to your point to risk all that downside when you're upside, when we're at all time highs is what, maybe 10, 20% at the most. It just, yeah. to me, it doesn't make any sense. Well, it certainly doesn't make any sense now. Okay. Right. Exactly. Uh, to be in a linear market, because I think everyone will agree that if you're speculating now, you are asking for trouble. You're going to, mm -hmm. you're going to, you're going to have foreclosures, bankruptcy. It's not going to be pretty, okay? Uh, yeah. Because we are, we are, we're late in the cycle. No question about that. I mean, no one would disagree with that except a fool. Uh, but um, 
yeah, you know, you're 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 right. It, it's just a it's just a very risky thing. Uh, but but you you hear the stories in those cyclical markets of people catching it just right, and I've caught it just right, uh, and yeah, many times in my life, and it's been great. It's a great ride. But yeah, know, but you know, you, you know how I always on. characterize that. Whenever I hear people push back with that, I always because when I first started in business, before I even got into any of that stuff, I was playing blackjack. And I was counting cards. So I, I really had this yeah. mindset of probabilities. <laughs> right. And it, mm -hmm. it stuck with me to this day. And the analogy that I always use when people say, yeah, but I would have missed out on the last two years of appreciation. I say, listen, if you're at the blackjack table and you've got a 19 and you hit. Yeah. On a you're you're going to go bust. <laughs> but, but, but let's say you get a two. Yeah. But let's say you get a two and you get blackjack. Does that mean does okay. does that mean that you made the right decision? I would say so absolutely no, you got lucky. not because you got if you lucky. make that over and over again, you're going to go bust. But mm -hmm. a lot of these people, they they talk about the past years of gains, even mm -hmm. though the probability of making those gains was extremely low. Just like your probability of winning if you hit on a 19 is extremely low. You know, actually, I'm not a gambler, but. That's a great metaphor you just made. I just thought of the connection. See, in, in the past 10 years, if you're sitting at that blackjack table buying income properties, you're getting the best cards in that deck. Say there's 52 cards, but there's really probably four decks, right? Uh, so there's, uh, you know, there's 206 cards or 208 cards or something, right? Uh, so you've gotten all of the good cards out of that shoot, right? already in the past 10 years the likelihood of more good cards coming late in the cycle is extremely low yeah so and, that, that's a good that's a good metaphor i know yeah, and i would take that. it a step further if you're using what we call basic strategy in blackjack mm -hmm. you're never going to hit on that 19. now you might lose you might miss out on a couple blackjacks but since you're betting with the probabilities in the long run you're always going to come out ahead. And it's just like mm -hmm. income properties. Because you're playing with the odds on your side, as long as you continue to do that over the long term, you're always going to come out ahead. Or if you risk that, if you risk hitting on a 19 by going into these cyclical markets, you might mm -hmm. have a winner here and there. But if you do it over the long term, you're going to lose. Yeah, you're very right. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. I know you guys got a ton of value from that interview. Jason is probably the top expert in rental properties in the entire United States. And that really showed in that little interview. But keep in mind, that's only part one of four. So stay tuned. We'll have parts two, three, and four coming out in the next couple weeks. For more information like this, check out this content right here, and I will see you on the next video.